Today we're talking, this, in this, this is the sixth of seven sessions, as you know, and uh, built around the, the acronym, the word miracle, and based on the four first verses of the book of Acts, which is where, which contains seven remarkable essentials for the Christian to embrace if we expect to continue what Jesus began. And I think that is the ministry and the purpose of the church. That is the reason for the, in, it, for the infilling of the Holy Spirit, for the granting of the Holy Spirit to us that we might then be able to continue what Christ began. That could not happen without the, the, without Calvary, without Jesus having assumed our guilt and the sins of the past. There could have been no Pentecost without Calvary. There could have been no reception of the Holy Spirit in our lives, the Spirit of God in us, unless our sins had been remitted. We know that doctrinally. We uh-huh that. But that's really important that it be revelation in us. And uh, it, once we come to understand that, that sin is what has doomed us and separated us from God and kept us separated from him throughout the time of the, Old Te the ages of the Old Testament and even through the years of Jesus' ministry, we still were separated by our sins so that God could not come and live in us like he originally planned when he breathed into his creation and they became living souls. They became, they became full of God's life. That was his plan. That was his desire to reproduce himself so that he could be in us. And sin broke that connection. And, and the blood of bulls and goats, all that Moses handed us, could not remit our sins. And with sin not remitted, then the Old Testament priests began to take financial advantage of the ritual of the Old Testament and make money off of it and uh, until God became tired of it and purposed that this would never work and therefore decided to give his son, Jesus Christ, to assume our guilt and, uh, and endure the, the judgment and the punishment of our sins so that they could be they could be fully paid for, remitted, put out of existence, gone. And, and that could only happen because Christ had no sin, so he laid down his life in our name. And we then, with our sins remitted by him, and as Hebrews teaches us, with him having returned to the Father, with his own blood, it being 
put on the altar where it yet speaks on our behalf. That having been done, we have a standing before God and before Satan that's legal. And that's the subject for today. The legality of our faith. <clears throat> the first lesson, miracle, M, Christ our model, how we see God. Second lesson, I, Christ our inspiration, how we see us, me, you. Third lesson, R, our response to his mandate, how we see our world. Fourth lesson, A, action as his delegates, what we do about our world. Fifth lesson, C, credibility of the gospel, how we do something about our world. How? Sixth lesson today, L, the legality of our faith, why we succeed. And the seventh lesson, which will be, is it next Monday? Or, uh, no, I don't. Anyway, it's coming up the next session. <laughs> e, the experience of his energy in us, our possibilities. But today, the legality of our faith. I'm, uh, I'm particularly moved by this lesson. I think it must be probably the most important of all of them. And I'm particularly moved because I've just come from Thailand, preaching to the people of a Buddhist monarchy. And, uh, and believe you me, that's a different experience. I was shocked by it in 1956, but I have to admit I had forgotten how my 1956 shock was validated, was valid. <laughs> it's, it's, it's not easy. And I'm buried right now in writing a book for Thailand that I'm going to call New Miracle Life Now because uh, uh, the, 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 the leaders in Thailand explain to me that the Buddhist believes in new life. They believe in a transformation, but it's involved in a reincarnation of life. It can't happen until we come back in our next uh, display of life. And so to have it now, I talked to them about the title before I left, New Miracle Life Now. Oh, they said that's altogether different. If there could be the hope of having that life now, that would be worth looking into. And so I'm buried in trying to present a book to the unconverted people of Thailand, the Buddhists. Uh, did you ever try to write a book for the Buddhists? Try it sometime. You know, we. I told my daughter, Dr. Ladonna, uh, we were talking about the book that I've authored, How to Be Born Again. I said, you know, going to Thailand has made me realize that I wrote that book for church sinners. Now think about that. See, did you ever write a book to sinners? You know, young people... When you write books, don't write them for preachers. 
Most all books are written for preachers. Preachers are already smart. They already know what they want to know and have made up their mind about it. So you waste your time to write to them. I learned that way back when I quit writing to preachers. My early books were all written to preachers. I wanted to justify myself and show that I was smart and that my books were right, and so I wrote them to preachers. I don't write that way anymore. And, but this one, but, but born again, I was shocked after I came back from Thailand to see. It's a beautiful book. It's a wonderful book. But I was shocked to see how it presumes knowledge by the unconverted that we're writing it to, supposed to. They're supposed to know all these, these terms that we use. They don't know what we're talking about. I prayed for years that God would help me always to be able to, to share the gospel in vocabulary that the unconverted can understand. Religion is club talk. We don't want that. We want to, we're already saved. We don't need to, to elaborate everything for us. We're saved. We're in. But the unconverted, they don't know what we're talking about. So we need to keep that in mind. Okay? <laughs> I hope that nickel drop. The big question for today that we're talking about, we're talking about the legality of our faith. The big question is how does Jesus minister today in our community, in our or in our nation? How? And then some little questions. How can the Holy Spirit, or no, can the Holy Spirit do God's work? without us. Now that's a hot one because a, a lot of people have shifted the burden of doing the work of God over onto him because he's so much more powerful and he, he can, he's spirit so he can float around and be anywhere and do all these things and we have to keep up with our television shows and all of our other responsibilities and don't have time to cover the, the the, the spectrum of ministry that he can do so easy. So we send him. And that's wonderfully convenient for the Pentecostal world. Can the Holy Spirit do God's work with us, without us, or with us? Another small question. Can we send angels to minister in our place. That's a good one. We figured we got that verse over in Hebrews, and that's really been a wonderful uh, cop out for Christians. <laughs> Can we send angels to minister in our place? We just send them off to do almost anything that God told us to do so that we don't have to bother them. <clears throat> Can we send them? Let's see, is this too close? Can we, can we send angels to do the work that Jesus commissioned us to do? Now, what are we talking about today? We're talking about the legality of, of our faith, why we succeed. Question, can we send angels to do what Jesus commissioned us to do? Good question. What does Jesus look like in our community. So, our legality, his presence in us, verse 3 of the book of Acts, he was seen, Jesus appeared to his followers. During 40 days, isn't this an amazing verse? Verse 3, 
during 40 days after his resurrection, speaking to them of the things concerning the kingdom of God. Wouldn't you love to have been there during those 40 days and heard his teaching? We only have the one single clue of what he talked about. And he says, he spoke to them concerning the kingdom of God. That really leaves it ambiguous. We can really argue over that. Why it open? The word kingdom is used 342 times in the New Testament in 316 Bible verses. What was Jesus teaching during those 40 days? I believe he was teaching our royal status in redemption. I think it's obvious, I won't go into all the, the proofs, but, it, but you're smart, you're Bible students. It's obvious that the followers of Christ did not understand the mission of Christ to us. They did not understand the fullness of, uh, of, the, crucif of the meaning of the crucifixion of Christ. They did not understand that uh, God was not in them, could not be in them. He could be with them. The Holy Spirit of God. See, Jesus stood in the temple and made that shocking statement. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Wow, did that stir them up. up turn turn them into rebels, those rabbis, because uh, he was so arrogant, sacrilegious in claiming the, the anointing of the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of the Lord God being upon him. It, it, was, a new, it was a new thought. They, they couldn't take that. I, they didn't understand that sin, they were still living in sin. Look, those followers of his, while he was here, were still trotting to the temple with their sacrifice for the priest to offer it, and then they'd go back and listen to Jesus' teaching. Think about that. That's pretty wild, isn't it? We don't talk like that. But, but it's because uh, we haven't understood this legal position, the legality of the Christian faith, if it's believed and understood. And so these people, they followed Jesus, they loved him, they believed in him because of the miracles. He was better than any rabbi or priest that they had followed. Uh, they could go to the temple, they didn't see miracles. If uh, the leper or the needy people, they couldn't come in the temple and worship. They were forbidden. And now here's this young, young Jew out here that believes in, in Moses and believes in the law and believes in the prophets and out here teaching, but he's teaching new stuff, different stuff. And they're very interested in it. But they didn't understand the meaning of redemption, yet they used the word. They didn't know what it meant. So we have to be real careful in our understanding of the scriptures or we tangle up the gospels and we try to make them New Testament stuff when they belong to the Old Testament. Very important to understand, redemption was not accomplished until the end of the Gospels. When Christ was crucified, when Christ 
assumed our judgment and our punishment on our behalf in our name and died, died, gave up his life, laid it down, died, and was buried on our behalf. To illustrate, I mean, I mean to confirm what the, what the scriptures had foretold, that he, his soul, was made an offering for our sin, that he was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace up on him, and with his stripes we are healed. We Pentecostals have turned that into arthritis and rheumatism and paralysis. But it's a, the, the meaning is bigger. Arthritis and rheumatism paralysis is part of the package of the destroyer. He gains entrance with these destructive forces through sin. When we sinned, these forces came upon us. And when Jesus died and remitted our sin, he also removed the authority of these diseases upon our physical bodies. See, they didn't understand that. They loved to see him heal people. They didn't know why he healed people. He was illustrating to us what would happen when this new posture was enacted. This new relationship with God when it was enacted. When it was, uh, when it was put into force. This couldn't happen until after the crucifixion, after the burial, after the resurrection, and after the ascension of Christ to complete the transaction of eliminating our sins. Then, the Father sending back up on us because we were redeemed then, his blood was put in the holy place in heaven, testifying, speaking yet today that we are redeemed. There's his blood. It's there. It speaks for us. You understand? So this, this new relationship could not be enacted until after we were paid for, we were our sins were buried, put away, and we came back to life with Christ with a new kind of life that didn't have sin. It's a new life. It's a miracle life. That's what I'm telling those, those, those Buddhists over there. It's a miracle life that we come back with the same life that God raised Jesus with. He laid down his life, but then God gave him another life and brought him back to live. And we came, we were brought back with him, we who believe. And therefore, being redeemed, being with our sins, being punished, our judgment having been endured in our name as our substitute, having been transformed by this new life, then, okay, then he could send that power that had been in Jesus, that was demonstrated in Jesus, that Jesus, Jesus showed us how it works then that could come into us. And with it coming, and com coming into us, we were born again and became new creatures in Christ. Everything previous passed away. Everything becoming new. And that is the kingdom of God. 
I marvel at how many preachers in America and England are still fighting and fussing about the kingdom of God and hanging all sorts of complicated definitions on it where it makes it look, look like the preacher is the only one that understands it. And that's kind of stupid. The kingdom of God is the king residing in the believer with all that the king is. He has set up his throne in you and in me. And we call that faith. But we get so complicated and carried away and mess it up and scare people. The simplicity of it is what Paul prayed that we wouldn't lose. The king comes to live in us. Ephesians says, we are built together as a habitation of God. Paul said, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. Paul said, the great mystery that's hidden from generations, the mystery that could never be explained by Old Testament prophets, that could never be illustrated by Old Testament sacrifices of animals, the mystery that could never be conveyed by Old Testament scriptures, the mystery that no one understood from generations. Paul said, at last, it's been made known to us. And it simply said, it's simply Christ in you, the hope of glory. How simple. The legality of our faith. But the Pentecostals have oh, so complicated this Holy Ghost teaching and all these things that it's made it seem something beyond our reach. Until today, let me make a statement that will shock you. I've debated whether or not to say it. Or, but I think, I, can, I think you're smart enough. I can say it. And you, it, it'll shock you. But then you'll figure it out later. It, it may give you a guideline, a key to help you get some things straight. I won't try to uh, elucidate uh, all of the implications of this. Pentecostals today, and not only them, but the charismatics. Can I say, I question that they believe the word of God. All this talk about the word, the word, everybody believes the word. The word. Yeah, no, I question whether or not they believe the word. They don't believe the word, they believe in the anointing. Now, that'll be a clue for you to weigh. Everybody wants an anointing, but they ignore what's written. I've been so thankful that as a young man, the first great healer, let's call him a healer for reference sake, that came across my path was F.F. F. Bosworth. And he was, he was a word man. He was a man who believed the scriptures. They tell me that up at Zion City, Illinois, under Dr. Dowie's, under one of Dr. Dowie's co-ministers, that F.F. F. Bosworth received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I believe that. But he believed in the word. He never depended on an anointing. I never heard him use the term. Now, that's very debatable because we can find all these references in the New Testament. So I don't want to confuse you, but I just want to say, if you're going to believe so much in the anointing, for heaven's sake, believe also in the word that's written. See, at least put that together. But being influenced by him, I never in my life was conscious of an anointing. I believe I'm anointed, 
because I believe I received the baptism of the Holy Ghost when I was young and I've walked in that faith all my life. I absolutely believe it and I've proven it. But I never depend on an anointing. I wouldn't know what that is. I guess it feels good if you have it. They tell me it does. Some folks jerk when they get it. Some folks holler and make animal sounds when they get it. You know, they do lots of funny things. So maybe it's a good idea. I don't want it. I'm doing just fine with this. I believe in the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I believe in the legality of our faith. I believe that we stand on totally legal grounds when we stand before the devil and when we stand before God. That's why I don't have fear thinking of, you know, I'm getting old enough, you think about dying. No problem. Wonderful. Welcome. And I have no intimidation in facing the biggest devil in town. Why should, that's not bragging. I'm legal. I'm legal. I don't mean I've got the twitch or I've got the jerk or I've got the sound so the devil's scared of me. No, no, I'm legal. I know what the book says. The devil knows what the book says. And when he knows that you know what the book says, he will look for the exit. I'm telling you, I've proven it all over my life, all over the world. No devils in India, no devils in Thailand, no devils in Indonesia, no devils in Africa that won't run. They're cowards when you bring this. But if you're going to bank on some special feeling when you go before people, you're going to be in trouble all your life. And the security of your legality Will not, will not be there. I hope you understand me right. Do you understand? I hope you understand me right. I, I don't have time to go into the, into the verses throughout the New Testament. It, it's, it's very important, though, that we understand that when redemption was accomplished, then the Holy Ghost could come into us and rule and be what he was in Jesus. Hallelujah. And that makes us legal. And the poor devil can't do a thing about it. That is done. Hallelujah. The sixth principle, our legality in God's plan. The legal aspect of redemption. The legal, God's legal reign through us as believers. Now, look, 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 think a little bit. That's why we don't talk about our ministry. It's his ministry. That's why we don't brag and claim some special gifts when we pray for someone and a headache disappears. No. It's his ministry. We can, we, can, we can reach a place where we don't want him to get the glory. We want the glory. If the people can touch us, we're the anointed ones. You'll get something wonderful. No, I want to lead people to touch him. He is the anointed one. He's in me. Yes, they touch me, they get blessed. I could tell lots of wild stories. I could tell, I could spend my life telling. A woman, one of our meetings, she determined to get close enough to me. To, uh, we never put barriers before us. Never, never, never. I don't want the people to be kept apart from me. I'm one of them. I always say it when they build a platform, make it where the people can put their elbows on the platform and look at me. I want them close. Now, most folks don't do that. That's all right. They, they, that's, that's their business. 
but I want the people close. You understand? This woman, got, she got close. She was blind. She had, fought for, she had tried for two days to get to the meeting, find her way there. Finally, someone helped her, and she asked him to put her by the platform because she had heard me preaching, and she wanted to be able to touch me. And she did. And while I was preaching, here someone grabbed me by the trouser leg and hung on, and started yelling, I can see, I can see, I see. Blind, they got healed. Okay, I could tell that and make people really want to touch me. I don't ever tell that because I don't like for people to think that, that this power radiates, you know, that I've got it, and if you get to me, you'll get it. No, I, if we can get the people to tune in to Jesus Christ and understand redemption, that when when he bore our sins and our judgment and took them all away, then the way was open for God's original plan, God to come in to us. When you have him in you, you don't need a touch from somebody. You know? And, and we either believe it or we believe in the touch. Now, I want to help you young people because, listen, the, that world is out there full of people, desperately needy of truth. Listen, I've never faced a greater challenge in my life than I'm facing in writing this book for the, for the Buddhists of the Thai uh, monarchy. You'll be, you'll be dying to get a copy of it, but it won't exist. It'll just be in Thai. If you want to learn Thai, go read it, okay. <laughs> I guess you could talk me out of a copy of the script. <laughs> That'd be the only way you could get it. And with, D, with, with, with CDs like they are, I guess that'd be possible, wouldn't it? Yeah. <laughs> but it's very important that we, we're growing up. And you understand? The church is not infant anymore. We brag on TV all over the world that we're about the, we're about the, the leaders of the world and we, we send our stuff to the whole world. Our, our, our American videos and CDs and DVDs and, ever, and tapes and, and everything that goes with it, our doctrine is dominating the world. We've got to grow up and be for real, and not, not export superstition, but export truth. The world is out there hurting. If you could look in the eyes of the, of, of the non-Christian people, they're hurting for truth. And then they get these things from America, and some of them, you know, it's, it, it, we assume that they know what we're talking about. We're talking riddles. And we need to gear up. I'm, gear, I'm trying to re-gear myself and talk the language so that when the translators translate our works, they'll, they'll be able to understand what we're saying. Am I complaining or am I helping you? I'm, 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 a, I'm, I'm, I'm appealing that we, that we, that we grow up, that we go with the book and that we tell the world what the book says. Look here, for example. See, that, I, said, I said God's legal reign through us as believers. That's why it's not our ministry. It's his ministry through us. He ministers through us. You pray for someone sick. They feel your hands, but it's his hands that heals them. Don't get all puffed up that you did it. He's the minister. We've got to grow up. We've got to, bring, we've got to influence some bending in our doctrine about that so that, we, so, that, so that we can help people more and not frighten them. You talk to them. Yeah, you give the gospel. You make the statement. Yeah, they hear your voice. But it's his truth that's changing them. 
It's not you. It's his truth. You embrace them. Wonderful. They feel your arms, but it's his love that's transforming them. You didn't do it. Let him do it through you. Be willing for him to be the star. Give him the credit. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe I. But maybe you wouldn't like to do that. Maybe you're. Maybe you'd rather get the credit. Okay, that's your right. Let let, let people know that you, you're you're the big thing. <laughs> and 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 shake and quake. And jerk, and whatever you want to do to convince them that you're it. But I would rather, I would rather let the kingdom of God operate the king in me, through me, to people. Hallelujah. 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 Let's read some of it. You know, I... The Holy Spirit upon them is the Holy Spirit in us. We're in a better setup than they were. Jesus, who began in one person, continues now in all people who believe. He's not limited to one. Christ in Jesus yesterday is Christ in you today. The same Jesus, different body. Same Jesus, same word, same truth. Hallelujah. Let it be and help people. Yeah. Do we believe this or do we need a touch? Romans 5 in the Living Bible. Since we've been made right in God's sight by faith in his promises, we can have real peace with him because of what Jesus has done for us. For because of our faith, he's brought us into this place of highest privilege. (laughs) It's really true. And we can actually become all that God had in mind for us to be. We can become the way Jesus was. That don't mean we get puffed up and get super duper holy. No, 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 no. He was in a human body, a carpenter. Working, rubbing shoulders with fishermen, tax collectors, common people. We don't have to get the big head and hang out a shingle that we're a healer now or that we're, we have special gifts. That, that's all good, nice. I love people that do that. I love people that do that. But, but to encourage you, our world is growing up with TV and with, with uh, email it's spreading all over the world. The world is growing up. Let's, let's try. Let's try to keep, let's try to keep the people with the option of truth in the Word of God. And we can do it. You're going to the world. You're going to be everywhere. And you can influence your world. Hallelujah. 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 How do you do it? People come to me all the time. I had a preacher the other day. He came to me, and it was nice. God bless him. Uh, they, said, they said, I've got all your books, and I've memorized them. said, now, would you, just, would you just speak some anointing into me? Some, so, so I don't know how to use that vocabulary, but I think something like that he said. Well, I thought, good heavens, what's this man wanting? <laughs> you know. No, no, no. Now, what would you do about that? Okay. Uh, Well, it went over my head. Because of our faith, he has brought us into this place of highest privilege. We can actually become all that God had in mind for us to be. Back when he created Adam and Eve, breathed into them, said, I want to be part of you. I want you to be like me, have all the power that I've got. You're my offspring. You're in the family. At last, Paul says, now we can be what God wants us to be. Why? Because our sins have been remitted because they were judged and the payment was paid in the crucifixion of Christ 
and our sins were set aside. So now he can come in us and be all that he dreamed of when he created Adam and Eve. Hallelujah. And that's a wonderful truth. Give God thanks for never quitting on us. Never quitting on us. He never quit on us. Hallelujah. He could have abandoned us, but he didn't. So, verse 9 in Romans 5. God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. How much more will he do for us now that he's declared us not guilty? He lives in us. He, we've got the whole kingdom belongs to us. It's all working in us. Give vent to it. Release it. Let the kingdom flow. Hallelujah. What was that song you were just singing? Let the river flow. Yeah, let the kingdom flow. Yeah. <laughs> Hallelujah. You believe that? The kingdom of God. Wow. Wow. Verse 23. This is the wonderful news that came to each of you and is now spreading all over the world. And I, Paul, or I say, and we have the joy of telling it to others. But let's tell it. Let's tell it. <laughs> let's tell it. Like it's written, is it not clear enough? Should he be crucified again? Should he send the Holy Ghost in a new endowment? Was Pentecost not good enough? Is the Bible not clear enough? Did the crucifixion not pay enough? What do we want? What are we going to tell our world? Let's, 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 I wrote a book, God's Best. Let's give them God's best. Amen. His written word, the seed of the word can never change. Do you believe that? Everywhere we go, verse 28, we talk about Christ to all who will listen. This is our work, and we can only do it. Listen to Paul's revelation. We can only do it because Jesus Christ's mighty energy is at work within us. Because the same energy that was in him is in us. That's why we could do it. But it couldn't be in us if our sins were there. But they were remitted. I believe in redemption. Do you believe your sins are put away? I'm aware that people make mistakes and commit sins, but we have an advocate. Now, if we keep doing the same thing, we're kind of stupid. You know, there's some verses in the Bible that talk about that. There's no more sacrifice for you. And you've created your own hell in a way. I mean, you messed up your own life. For me, I believe what he says. I believe my sins are put away. If I err, I ask forgiveness. I don't do that again. Every error that we make is a learning experience, isn't it? Like problems. They're learning. They're our greatest teachers. I don't mean go out and err so you can be taught. But I mean, when you do flub up, it's your great teacher in a sense. And you can train the devil to leave you alone because every time he tempts you and causes you to err, you grow by it. And you bypass Mr. Satan and you grow beyond him. Does that make sense? Am I talking riddles? It's true. It's true. I believe in redemption. Believe in redemption. Believe in in the book of Romans, believe in what Christ has accomplished for you. <clears throat> he taught us the legal base. Let's talk about this kingdom life. During 40 days, he talked to us about it. He taught us the legal basis of redemption. I am sure that during those 40 days, what he talked to these people about was what had he had accomplished on the cross for them. He explained it to them. Using the Old Testament, the abundant Old Testament scriptures to unlock it for them. The truth 
that Paul was blind to, Saul was blind to. But one day, when the revelation came, the Buddhists call it enlightenment. And a light shined for sure. They have light, we have light, you know. Their light's about Buddha, ours about Jesus. And, and the light shined on Paul. And Paul then went off to Arabia to ponder. His brain was like a computer, all of the scriptures, because I think I said this the other day, because all, uh, a, a rabbi is incumbent upon him that he knows all the Old Testament scriptures. And went off into Arabia to, to roll through those, uh, those great volumes of scriptures and behold the Christ that he had missed. And he understood redemption, what Christ had accomplished. We need that revelation. Yeah. Paul was religious. Paul quoted the scriptures, but it wasn't a revelation. Yeah. Many people today know the scriptures, can quote them to you, but then they'll turn right around and contradict it by the way they act and the way they talk. Right. We're redeemed. We're legal. Poor devil, we're legal. Hallelujah. 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 He, I'm sure that's what Jesus taught during those 40 days. Taught them the meaning. The, the amazing thing is that even after he taught them that, they didn't catch on to it. Isn't that phenomenal? Don't blame yourself if you're slow to catch on something. Just don't get mad in the process. Yeah. See. He must have taught them that. How God can live in us. How Christ could then come and that power that was on him could come and reign in them. We're legal because we're redeemed. Because we're reconciled to God. Because he now lives in us. Because we are now his headquarters. We're legal. That's the kingdom of God. That can only exist because of redemption. What does redemption mean? What does it mean to redeem? You've got dictionaries. I just looked at a dictionary. To ransom. To live. I believe this is me. Ransom. Liberate. Rescue from captivity or bondage or from any liability or obligation to suffer by paying a ransom. I believe that about me. I didn't do it. God, Jesus did it for me. Willingly. Because he loved me. Wow, that makes me walk tall. When I think of the intense love that God had for me to pay that price for me. That is reality to me. That is excitement to me. I love to preach about that. That's not ho-hum to me. And I don't hardly hear that preached on TV. Let's nor in pulpits that I visit. Let's preach it. Let it be the joy that we have that keeps us young and vigorous because it's such a revelation, such a glorious position to be in. It means to rescue, to deliver, to reclaim by moving all obligation, by paying the total ransom price. What was the ransom price demanded? Death. The wages of sin is death. The soul, the sinner, shall die. The thief comes to kill, steal, and to kill, steal, and destroy. Death is the penalty of sin. Is death is the ransom Satan demanded of us. And God said, I can't pay it. I love them. I don't want them to die. I want them to live. I'll give my son as their substitute. He has no sin. He owes nothing to you, but he will give his life to you and pay the ransom. But when he pays it, one thing for sure, Slewfoot, keep your hand off of those who hear about it and believe it. Don't touch them. They're redeemed. There's no more legal 
no, no more legal requirements that you can make on them. Leave them alone. When they come to you in my name, they're free. They can stand before you. You can't touch them. That's redemption. That's, that's the kingdom of God established in us. It means to deliver from the bondage of sin and the penalties of God's violated laws or from the consequences of sin through the reconciliation with God affected by the atonement of Christ. Now that's a mouthful, isn't it? But that's good stuff. That's right. Right on. Did you hear it? I don't think I better try to read that again. I might never make it through and you'd get tired. A payment that releases one from captivity or punishment or any kind of penalty. I don't owe nothing to Slewfoot. He can gather his hordes around me. I can stand redeemed. I'm enlightened. As the Buddhist would say, I'm free. The light has shined in me. And God has revealed the power working in me to be the same that he used, that he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead. I'm legal, poor devil. I'm legal. My friends, my young friends, I hope some of these words will echo back to you in your sleep, in dreams, in your frightening times. When you go abroad, you come into areas that are non-Christian. I hope some of these words will echo back to you and you'll stand tall and believe in the Christ you've come to represent. Believe in what he's accomplished for you and stand before every devil in that territory until they find the exit and leave. Hallelujah. I'm just as sure as I can be when I get to town, the devil gets worried. Right. And I don't blame him. I don't. He's got, he's got some sense. Not good sense, but some sense. Hallelujah. The old English law. Old English law. That, what, what is redeemed? That which is paid for the pardon of an offense in lieu of punishment. Hallelujah. Jesus paid for the pardon of our offense in place of us having to be punished for our sin. We're redeemed. We're redeemed. Redeemed. To release from captivity, slavery, servitude, punishment, by paying a price. To regain possession by a legal payment of ransom. (laughs) Poor devil. He's in trouble. God has regained the possession of me. I was out there subject to the enemy. He's the boss out there in the unconverted world. He's nothing in the church. He's nothing among the converted. But out there, he's the boss. I was victim. But I heard of Jesus and fell before him and accepted him. And the devil hasn't been able to control me since. Hallelujah. You believe it? This is real to me. We're redeemed. Therefore, our standing before God and before Satan is legal. Say, I'm legal. legal. The Bible says we're justified through redemption. Justified, that's a big word. But we in America know what it means because we've heard the cute little application, just as if I'd never done it, you know. Justified. But that's what it means. Beautiful definition. You can't do that in any other language. Just as if I'd never sinned. I'm justified. Redemption makes me. Redemption. Redemption. He deemed us before, but he redeems us at the cross. He deemed that we were wonderful when he breathed into us and we became a living soul in the Garden of Eden. But then after our 
our ugly past. Then he redeemed us at the cross. And his new, he now deems us beautiful, worthy, just like him, set free, hallelujah, justified. You believe you're redeemed? Yes. Say, that's me. Say, poor devil. Poor He's, lost me. He's lost me. I'm legal. I'm legal. Wow. wow. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Glory to God. 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 Romans 3, 24. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Pretty plain, isn't it? If that don't excite you, if you can't get a sermon looking at that, you're in trouble. Start over. Titus 2.14. Who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar, special people zealous of good works. That's me. Hallelujah. Say, that's me. <laughs> Say, devil, I'm coming. <laughs> Hallelujah. Oh, I say, I say these things reverently. This is what keeps the spring in this old guy's step. I'm redeemed. And Paul said, we talk about this to everyone that will listen. We can only do it because of the energy of Jesus Christ in us. Colossians 1.14, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the remission of sins. Translators made a mistake there. They said forgiveness of sins, but it is not forgiveness, it's remission. Big difference. Forgiveness is an Old Testament word. Remission is a New Testament word. Remission, you can't find in the Old Testament. Remission, when it removes them. Forgiveness, then you do it again. I wonder sometimes a lot of people don't get forgiveness. <laughs> you know, and then they go do it again and again and again. No, I'm redeemed. Hallelujah. Remitted. It's remitted. I'm clean. It's gone. Hallelujah. If I make a mistake, quickly, I... Talk to my advocate. Say, don't charge that again. He says, wiped out, wiped out, wiped out. The blood speaks for you. You're okay. Keep going. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hebrews 9, 12. Neither by the blood of bulls and goats, uh, the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. We're redeemed now. We're redeemed when we get in trouble. We're, I mean, when, you know, when, when sickness comes, we're redeemed when we're laying on our deathbed just before we close our eyes for the last time, breathe our last breath. We're redeemed. I always love what Brother Bosworth always said. He said, Brother Osborne, I'm, 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 I'm saved. I'm being saved right now. And tonight when I go to bed, I'll still be being saved. And tomorrow morning, I'll still be being saved until the day that I die, and I'll get more salvation than I ever got before in my life. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? Yeah, I believe that. That's exciting. Let's not mix salvation, redemption, ho-hum stuff, and go try to find some new idea to preach a sermon on. This is what changes the world. They're not interested in your new ideas, trying to get ahead of somebody else that was the last speaker over here in America or where we know everything. No, 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 forget that. Preach the gospel. God will confirm you. You'll see results. And even the Americans will come running to it because they don't hear it. Good counsel. Yeah, think about it. 1 Peter 1.18, you know that you were redeemed, not with corruptible things, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish, without spot. Revelations 5.9, they sung a new song. I'll help them sing that song someday. <laughs> Won't you? Yeah. 
boy, oh boy, thou art worthy, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and, and people and nation. You believe it? Because we are redeemed, God can come and live in us. Our standing is before Satan and before God is legal. The first report that was ever given of Jesus' life and ministry is in Mark 1, 14, 15. I think it might be the most profound scriptures that we have for, for understanding the overall ministry of uh, New Testament ministry. After John was put in prison, here, here, here's the part. Jesus came into Galilee. He'd been in the desert. He's coming, starting his ministry. Jesus, remember this. Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. Think of it. He came, why did it say that? He came to preach and teach and show what God is like in a human person, in human flesh. To him, that was the king coming to reign in people like he does in Jesus. But he knew that couldn't happen yet because redemption had not been accomplished. But he came preaching that. That was his purpose. That's why I say when he came back from the dead, he spent 40 days with them teaching them concerning the kingdom of God. Same thing. Wanting to show the people. Now, now he comes back. He's wanting to show them. Now the price has been paid. Now understand that's why this Holy Ghost has come to you to fill you so you'll be just like me. I've stayed 40 days to teach you that. Didn't you catch on? No, we'll look at that in just a jiffy. They didn't. Preaching the gospel. Am I going too fast? Is that okay? You with me? You with me? Preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. How did he express it? We have just a little insight. But it's very fundamental. He says, and saying, this was his sermon. This is how I preached. This is the essence of his message. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Now look what he's saying there. The time is fulfilled. It's just, it's just three years before he's to be crucified. The time is drawing close. The kingdom of God is at hand. See, not here yet. It's at hand. This is going to be the result of my crucifixion and resurrection when I come back from the dead. And I'll tell you about it. But he came preaching the kingdom of God, saying the time is fulfilled. It's time for all this that the prophets have talked about. The kingdom of God, the kingdom of God is at hand so, you got a big challenge, folks, he says. Repent. And believe the gospel. I think it's the most powerful two verses in the New Testament. So, repent and believe the gospel. Why did you say repent? Repent, change your mind. Look, these people were all running to the temple with their calves and bulls, and goats, and doves, sacrificing them all the time. Jesus is striking at the heart of the Old Testament, Mosaic, law, and the prophets. Everything that was religious. I don't want to talk over your heads. Listen to me. Get this picture, and you'll un you won't be troubled and confused by Old Testament scriptures anymore. You see a difference at the cross. It's different this side of the cross. After the cross, it's new. It's a new generation. It's redeemed. It's the kingdom of God coming. It's God coming in people over here. No, nobody. 
Nobody. They could talk about him and be with him. Get this. Are you hearing me? This is so important. He's trying to get them to understand that. Repent. Repent. You're going to have to repent. Now, we think of repenting as rolling and crying and bawling on the floor and sobbing for our sins. No, that's not repentance. That's sometimes. That, that don't get you anywhere. That's why a lot of people do that. Just come back next week and do it again, you know, because it don't get you anywhere. No, no. But change your mind. Change. On the basis of what? On the basis of truth. On the basis of what is written. Change your mind. Decide that you're going to accept what is written, and you're going to live your life on. That's what began our ministry. After seeing that man with all those miracles, then we went home with our Bibles, and we sat there and we read the New Testament as though, uh, the, the Gospels, as though we had never heard that they existed. And we made this vow. We said everything that Jesus said that he will do, we'll expect him to do it. Everything that he says for us to do, we will do it. And that's what began our ministry. And we went into action, called the people. Uh, sick folks didn't come to church back in those days. They went to the hospital. But we called them to the church, which was phenomenal. And they packed the old tabernacle. I don't mean everybody. A lot, a lot of sick people came. But I mean in general. That was a new thing. And, and, uh, and they came, and we lined them up. We preached to them. People got saved. We lined them up. They got healed. It seemed like everybody that we touched got healed. Now, God was good to us. It won't always be that way. But, but the point is, we repented. We said that old way won't work. We always prayed for the sick. Every Friday night, in any meeting we ever had anywhere, we prayed for the sick. Now, don't ask me why we didn't do it on Thursday night. We prayed for the sick on Friday night. That was the night you prayed for the sick. I don't remember anything ever happening. Few people fell to accommodate us, but uh, but but uh, didn't. Uh, I don't remember anything. You know, you know that that wasn't of interest. You know, uh, but but see, we saw that and we repented. We said, and I'll never forget when I was sitting up there in the balcony, the third balcony, and that man ministering to those people and being healed. That, that, that first one was deaf and dumb. And I, I was a praying Pentecostal, a, 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 a noise-making Pentecostal. And I really, uh, uh, when I saw that, when I heard him announce this girl was born deaf and dumb, I, I was really, I was ready to do battle with him. I mean, with him, on his side. You know, this, this is a big devil we had to deal with. And... Uh, I was really wrought up about it. You know, we, we felt like we were sinners if we didn't pray three hours a day. I had calluses on my knees when I got, when I got married. Dear Brother Dillard, God bless Brother Dillard, when he took me from the farm, he made me pray three hours every day, but he wouldn't let me have any dates with any girls. And I look back and thank God during those years, 16, 17, 18, he didn't let me date girls, but he had me praying three hours every day. Thank God for a man that would do that to me. Uh, sometimes I got mad at him for that, but I didn't say so. <laughs> I didn't say so. <laughs> I was good. But, but, but when, so, so, then, so then we, we in our meetings, we prayed for the sick. But uh, I don't remember what happened to him, if anything happened. But we prayed for him. You've got to pray for him. If you're a Pentecostal, you've got to pray for him. And, but uh, when I sat up there on that balcony and saw that man, and he took that little girl and he pulled her to his side, real gentle-like. Uh, I guess I'll just say this and tell you. I'll tell you this in the next session. It's quite a story. It's quite a story. But, but, but the, the, my point is, and, and I'll remember it, I'll, I'll tell it. Uh, my point is, repent and believe the gospel. That's all Jesus said. That, that covers it all. Repent of your old way of doing things and believe the good news that everything's already done for you. 
You don't have to work at it anymore. You don't need any more ceremonies, no more rituals, no more dogmas. Just repent. Leave all that with Moses. And you believe the gospel. The good news, Bosworth used to say so sweet, he'd say, what good news? I'm quoting him now. What good news? Good news to the sinner. What good news? Good news that Jesus bore your sin. Why? So that you don't have to bear your sin. So what? So you're saved. Good news to the sick. What good news? Good news that Jesus bore your sickness. Why? So that you don't have to bear it. So what? You're healed by his stripes. Good news to the guilty. What good news? Good. <laughs> see, see, see. And, and he'd go down that line. I thank God that I heard that when I was young. It made sense. Repent. The old way don't work. Forget it. Leave it the other side of the cross. Believe the gospel. Believe the good news. Oh, if we could get the world to understand that salvation is not our idea. It's God's idea. We didn't love him. He loved us. We didn't come to him. He came to us. We didn't cry out for salvation. He cried to us and said, I come to save you. Repent. The old ways are clumsy. They don't work. Believe the gospel. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You believe that? Yeah. You believe that? <clears throat> Hallelujah. He came preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. See, that's what he came doing. And when he came back from the dead, still on the same subject, teaching them concerning the kingdom of God. The last words that's ever written of, of Paul the apostle is in jail at Rome, waiting to be executed, and they let people come and see him, and he talked to them day and night concerning the kingdom of God. Paul caught on to what it was all about. That's why he wrote those letters about the power of the, the, the new birth of Christ coming into us and live in us. It was something that the religious people could not understand. They still have trouble understanding it. They want to tack on to it some creeds, some dogmas, some rituals, some ceremonies, some formalities, and then we get it. No, it's free. It's good news. You don't have to do it. Leave that with Moses. We're talking about how does Jesus function today in your world, in your neighborhood. The answer, since we are redeemed, he functions through us. Simple most powerful lesson of all of these lessons is this one today. Hallelujah. You believe it? Yeah. You and I are on legal grounds. Yeah. That's the secret of our victories. We're talking today on this sixth lesson. Why do we succeed? That's why. We're legal. We're created by God as friends and partners. I like that. <laughs> we talk about Abraham, the friend of God. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Say me too. We're loved by God. We're redeemed by God. We're justified by God. We have peace with God. We didn't do it. We didn't want it. He wanted it because he wanted our partnership. He loves us. He's delighted with us. God is tickled pink about us, loving us believing in us, working with us, confirming us, wherever we teach, wherever we go, if we preach the good news, the kingdom of God, the, good, the, the new birth makes possible. The king. Every time, every time any person is born again, is, is, is reconciled to God in your meeting under your ministry, the kingdom of God comes in another person. Isn't that true? The king comes to reign in them. Teach them that. They'll enjoy it. They'll feel like you're the greatest teacher ever hit town. They'll want you to come back for bigger meetings. You teach some of this stuff, they'll say, where do you get that? That didn't go over. Romans 8, 1 to 3. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. 
See, there where Paul filled in kind of like I did a while ago. If you make a mess of things, you have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Is that right? Sure. So ever, 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 ever problem becomes a learning process and you grow. And the devil learns better to leave you alone. The law of the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of life in Christ. Do you get that? The law of the Spirit of life in Christ has made us free from the law of sin and death. Hallelujah. I live that way. We're called. <laughs> he knew us in advance. He justified us. He glorified us. Romans 8. Them that love God, who are the called according to his purpose. 29. Verse 29. Whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate. <laughs> to what for? That's, that's, see, Paul had it. He had it. He predestinated us. What for? What for? To be conformed, to be transformed, to be conformed. How? To the image of his son. See, we're to imitate him. We're to mimic him. We're to do like he did. When I sat in that third balcony, I keep wanting to come back to that. Voices whirled over my head and said, when that girl was healed, I'll tell you about that in the next session. But, but uh, I have to, I'm dancing around it. But those voices said, you can do that. You can do that. Voices, oh, wow. I went wild. I didn't, I didn't holler or nothing. I just, hmm. I wept, I wept. You can do that. You can do that. That proves the Bible way is for today. Jesus did it that way. Peter did it that way. Paul did it that way. You can do that. You can do that. I'm telling you, folks. And I went and did that. I repented. I repented. I discovered the king lived in me. Hallelujah. And I discovered that all I needed to do was go and speak his word and let him carry out his power through me. And he would do it. He wanted to identify with me because, because I'm redeemed. He paid for it. He ransomed me. He loves me. He believes in me. He brought me back from the gutter. He says, stand tall. I'm in you. Don't forget it. We're together. Hallelujah. Does that turn you on? Yeah. Wow. Wow. You know, that's why... You know, that's why I, I don't come over here in America and teach much because it, it, it's too, it, 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 can, it can imply conflict between what's more popular. And I don't want to cause conflict. I don't want anybody to feel I'm strutting around trying to act like I know more than anybody else. No, no, no. But what I know is ancient. It's true. It's proven. And so... When I get caught in a place like this where it's a bunch of Bible students, I think I ought to open up a little bit more, you know. And that's why I've done it. And, and, and thank you. And, and, the, and, and I want to tell you, the other reason I've done it, I know your pastor. I know your pastor. I know him. I know what he believes. And I know where he stands. And we're together. And I wouldn't do this. If, if I thought he didn't believe what I'm sharing with you because that wouldn't be courteous. I, I don't believe in going to another person's pulpit and deliberately setting up conflict. And you remember that as preachers. If, you know, don't go out and cause a fuss. Be a gentleman. Be a gentle lady and, and, uh, and, 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 and help people. You can, you can dance around a little bit and get, get your truth through. Uh, okay, I've made my point. For... Whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be, oh my, this turns me on, to be conformed to the image of his son. Hallelujah. 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 And whom he called, them he justified. Whom he justified, he glorified. 
the Buddhists talk about enlightenment, I talk about glory. <laughs> you talk about anointing, I guess that's what it is. Maybe it's anointing, maybe it's glory, maybe it's enlightenment. I don't know what it is, but it's good stuff that shines the light of God's presence on us and through us to a hurting world that's lost in darkness. Hallelujah. Brother McIntosh, you can straighten all this up after I'm gone. <laughs> no, you won't straighten it up. That's good stuff, and you believe that. If I didn't, if I, if I didn't know you believe that, I wouldn't be here. <laughs> you know that now. I've already said that. Listen, look, look. He did all that for us. He did all that for us. Say, he did all that for me. <laughs> Called me. Called. Justified me. Glorified me. So, the next sentence, what shall we say then about it? <laughs> you know, it just, Paul is so overpowered by these truths. He said, what are we going to say about all this? Well, he said, to make it short, we're going to say, if God is for us, in, to that degree, who can be against us? What devil can stand before us? Believe it. Believe it. Believe it. You know, I, I, I'm aware that a lot of people think, well, Brother Osborne, you preach all those big crowds and all those big people. I don't have a big crowd, and so I don't have the opportunity that you have. Listen, whether it's one or a hundred thousand, treat them the same. Teach the truth. It'll work. And when you minister to them, remember in a hundred thousand people, how many people are there that don't appear to be healed? I face that too. And I see those people still in wheelchairs, still on crutches. And, and, and my heart agonizes because I crossed the ocean maybe to come and help them. And I believe all this. Then things happen in a long life that reconfirm you. See, I have, I have the same problems you have. Yes, many wonderful things happen. Now, like I said the other day, we counted, I think it was five wheelchairs at once in the air in, in Bogota, three in Bangkok at one time. In the, but there were others that didn't raise their wheelchairs. What do I do about that? Well, what are you going to do when you pray for someone and they're not manifestly healed? What are you going to do about it? Are you going to quit? Am I going to come home? No. You're going to believe. And I always teach these people, if your healing is not manifested right now, believe in the truth of what God's promise is. The seed is in you, and the seed will grow. And I'll use it to tell them a story or two about a farmer planting seed. Does it grow? Do you have to pray to make it grow? No, it grows. And, the heart, and I tell them the, the seed, and I tell them, Jesus said this is the seed of God's Word. And I explain that to them and say, believe that this is in you now, and it will grow. Uh, tomorrow you'll be better. Next day you'll be better. Maybe some of you, it might take a week or two or three or a month before you get well. But believe that Jesus came to you tonight. Now, see, I, I, I teach that to people. Now, people might say, that's a cop-out. You're trying to cover up for folks who don't get healed. No, you're trying to encourage everybody. Jesus healed them all. The, the, the gospel of healing is for all. Am I making sense? Yeah. And I hope that helps you. And so I start to say, once in a while, when you live a long time, you're young and it hasn't happened yet. I mean, you live as long as I have, 80 years old. See, uh, here, here I go back to Thailand. And what, what happens? On the front row of the platform in the opening night when I've got a bunch of preachers there that never preached a sermon on healing in their life, one or two of them well, I had some Pentecostals, one or two Pentecostals, but there were Baptists and Methodists. I told you this the other day. And Church of Christ and all those beautiful people that were risking backing this crusade because one Pentecostal, that man who was the Pentecostal, had great integrity. And they believed in him. And so there we were, and me stepping up there to preach and teach. And on the front row of that platform sat an 84-year-old man 
who had come to our meeting in 1956, a hopeless leper, his hands all drawn up, crippled. I told you this, but bears repeating, all because I have a different purpose in telling it this time, drawn up, his face all disfigured, part of his nose gone, part of his ears gone, really homely man, a ghastly looking man, his eyes, part of the flesh gone, but he, you know, but there he was smiling, so precious. And, and in 1956, he was healed. I didn't know he was healed. I just preached, and I just believed. And they tell me that I had laid hands on him. I don't remember that. Because uh, I remember in some of those meetings in Thailand, there was a few of them that were small meetings, not many people, and so I felt, well, I can lay hands on them and pray for them, and so I did that. And so he was one of them. I didn't remember anything special, but I know what I must have done. I must have been very sincere and prayed with, with compassion for his healing and must have encouraged him to believe now that the leprosy is cursed. You know, uh, I'll come back to that. Uh, in, in, in one meeting in Latin America, 11 lepers were brought to the platform. I heard they'd sneaked out from the leprosarium and came uh, in secret. And someone found out about it and told me, I said, bring them to the platform. I thought they should be honored and brought them to the platform. And I'll never forget that. The Holy Ghost, you know, was hot in me. You call that anointing? I don't know. Maybe, maybe that was anointing. Maybe I was anointed. I don't know. I never thought about anointing. I thought about this. He said, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. And Daisy and I went down the row and took each one of them, not by their clothes, but by their hands, by their flesh. And I remember the prayer that come out of me. So from my insides, be clean, flesh. Be clean in Jesus' name. And I went down the, everyone. And then the police took them back to the leprosy. I never knew what happened after that. I'm just like you. I believe this. Act on it. Whether you've got one or 10,000, be faithful to the Word of God. Don't be faithful to the camera. Once it demonstrates something big so you can go home and hang your shingle higher and say, look at me, I've had a great meeting. No, no, that's silly. Grow up. Let Christ grow up in you. It wasn't but a few weeks till the pastor of that city wrote and told us one of them had been released. And a few more weeks, another one. Within a year, all 11 of those lepers were released healed. Now think about that. Now that's the truth. That's the truth. I, wrote you that letter, I, I read you that letter from that Pentecostal wholeness missionary in Hong Kong. Six lepers healed. Lepers? What's the difference to a leper? Cancer, arthritis, anything. It's disease. We're talking about why do we succeed? The kingdom of God is in us. The king ministers through us. His kingdom is expressed through us. We're on legal grounds. You believe that? Who shall lay anything? Who shall, who, what shall we say to these things? God be for us. Who can be against us? Hallelujah. Kingdom facts. <laughs> We're on legal ground. Hallelujah. In the kingdom of God, his presence is in us. We are legal. The Bible, the Bible said, Paul got carried away in Romans, the 14th chapter and the 17th verse. But before I read that, I got, I got to comment on this Luke 17, 21, because that sounds, some of you are smart, and you might look at this and think, wait, I've caught Osborne. He, he's, he's. It says, Jesus said, the kingdom of God is within you. Now, that couldn't be true without redemption. The translators had to make an error there because the king could not come in to people before their sins were remitted. I think what was said, the kingdom of God will be within you. Now, okay, you can judge me for that. You can write me off. But uh, you better do some thinking. Some folks think if they think, they're carnal. I'm not. 
My mind's not carnal. My mind is conformed to the truth of the Word of God. I don't think carnal. But see, that, that would set up a contradiction. Say the kingdom is within you. For Jesus to say that before he was crucified and paid for their sins. You have to understand that. And I'm sure that the translation, oh, so many, like that remission, that forgiveness word. That's not the word at all. It's forgiveness. I don't want to cast doubt on the translators because we know they've done a wonderful job. But we have to think, understand the overall picture of redemption and understand the difference before the cross and after the cross. And then we won't have confusion. Like Daniel praying three weeks to get his prayer answered. Then we come over and preach that day. Hang in there. Maybe three weeks for God. Don't insult my advocate, the Father, at the right hand of the Father that hears me and makes intercession. Don't tell me it's going to take three weeks to get to his attention. No, no, no. That Old Testament stuff. When you understand the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament, you'll have to think. And don't let these things be confusing to you, but see them in the light of redemption and you'll understand and, and, you, and you'll know you're legal. You, you won't be scared. You won't be spooky. You won't be doubtful. You won't be hesitant. See what I'm saying? Say, I like it. But the one I was going to read you, Paul said, Romans 14, 17, the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Now think about that. Righteousness. Why did he put that first? Isn't that what has to come first? You can't have the king without righteousness. It's imputed to you because he died on the cross. His, your sins were imputed to his account. His righteousness was imputed to your account. And now the kingdom of God is righteousness. So what? Peace. You can't have peace. You can't have peace without righteousness. If you don't know your sins are remitted, you'll never calm down and have assurance and peace. But, but peace, hallelujah. I have righteousness, so I have peace. Well, of course I'm happy and joy. And joy. See, Paul knew what he was talking about. The kingdom facts. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Say, I love it. God created this world. God owns this world. God has a right to rule this world. God wills to rule this world through people like you and me. That is his kingdom on earth. Hallelujah. Is that right? Christ in us. 1 Corinthians 13, Living Bible. He has rescued us out of the darkness and gloom of Satan's kingdom. You bet. And brought us into there's a difference before the cross and after. Into the kingdom of his dear son. Now, verse 21, he has brought you back as his friends. Verse 22, now as a result, Christ has brought, say I'm listening. Listen. Say it's not ho-hum. It's, hum. it's reality. Now as a result, Christ has brought you into the very presence of God and you are standing there before him with nothing left against you. <laughs> Hallelujah. I want to cry when I think about that. We are redeemed. We are legal. The kingdom is in That's why we succeed. He's in us. Romans 5, 2. Because of our faith, he has brought us into this place of highest privilege where we stand. Verse 9, now he has declared us not guilty. Romans 5, 11, now we rejoice in our wonderful new relationship with God, all because of what our Lord Jesus Christ has done in dying for our sins, making us the friends of God. 1 Corinthians 3, 9, Living Bible, we are God's co-workers. You bet. We walk arm in arm with him. Hallelujah. It's beautiful. Kingdom, uh, that's kingdom fact. Kingdom dynamics. <clears throat> the gospel is a legal document for all the world, for every creature, for all nations till the end of the world. Say, I believe it. I believe it. So, so what? So, 
Take that legality and go with it. Take that name and use it. Take that power and heal and bless people. Take that anointing and deliver people. Take that message and announce it. Take that authority and liberate folks. You can do it. Glory to God. Just like the voice has said to me in that meeting, you can do that, you can do that. That proves yeah. the Bible, so you can do that. Peter did that, John did that, Paul did that. You can do that. That's the way Jesus did it. That's what he came for, to show us. They came preaching the kingdom of God, saying, repent, change your old way, don't work. Get it out of your brain and believe the gospel. Believe the good news. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Paul said, that's it. That's the mystery hidden from generations past and is now made manifest to the saints of God, Christ in you. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, I'd like to tell you about my government in Yeti among the Kikuyus and about the blind man in Buffalo, about Daisy and the Haji in Java. <laughs> we're, le I haven't got to we're legal. We are kingdom people. We are royalty. We are connected. Our kinship with him makes us legal. Our membership in his family is real. Hallelujah. Say, I like it. First Peter, you're a chosen generation. Say, that's me. A royal priesthood. Say, I'm royal. A holy nation. Say, I'm holy. A peculiar people. Say, I'm peculiar. And I have to stop there and tell you that don't mean funny. That means exclusive. It's a French word. And Americans use it wrong. Peculiar. He's a peculiar fellow. Funny. No, no, don't mean that at all. But in America it does. It's our connotation. But the real mean, and that's why it's used here, peculiar people mean, don't mean a funny people that act stupid. <laughs> it means a, a choice people. A people chosen exclusively, uniquely for him. Hallelujah. C'est un peuple peculier. C'est merveilleux de connaître la relation entre nous et Dieu. Parce qu'il nous a choisis, nous a justifiés, nous a rachetés par le sang de Jésus-Christ. Et nous sommes en lui maintenant. Et lui, il est en nous. Et le pauvre diable ne peut rien faire pour pour, pour nous interdire. Gloire à Dieu. Alléluia. Vous qui parlez français, dites Amen. Personne? Personne? Personne, oui. OK. The chosen people. We are builded together for a habitation of God through the Spirit, founded on the rock, Christ Jesus, 1 Corinthians 3.11, for other foundation can no one lay than that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. Only on the rock of redemption can we experience legality, the legality of the kingdom of God in us. And I'd like to talk about kingdom virtue, but let's go to our piece of paper and read and torment the devil. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Poor devil. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for the honor of addressing these beautiful, these beautiful Bible students growing with God. You've blessed them. You've chosen them. You've brought them here to this place. You've put them under good leadership. You've honored me to be able to come and share this truth that's so real. Thank you for it. Hallelujah. You ready? Got your paper? Okay, let's go on the first word. Okay, Lord Jesus, you want to continue your ministry and to do your work through me. Now that I have received you, God's plan is to be expressed through me. I do not pray and send angels to do what you have sent me to do. I am a member of God's royal family. I am a legal part of the kingdom of God. You are my king, and you have set up your headquarters at my house. You live in me. Since you have redeemed me from my sins, now you are alive in me. Your Holy Spirit can function through me. That is your kingdom in me. My position with you and before Satan is legal. 
Jesus, you now reign in my life. When Satan approaches me, he confronts you. I have legality. The king rules through me. Your presence is in me. Hallelujah. My sins are remitted forever. I am born from above. I am called. I am justified. I am redeemed. I am glorified. I am legal. I am royal. I have peace with God. Jesus, you are my king. You are alive in me. I am triumphant in you. Amen. Hallelujah. Put up your hands and thank God. Glory to 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 God. Hallelujah. Poor devil. Poor devil. Hallelujah. 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 We can change our world. We can bring truth to our world. Let's do it. Hallelujah. Put up your hand. Say, thank you, Jesus. I'm alive in this generation with so many opportunities. Hallelujah. I can go to the end of the world. Thank you for electronics. Thank you for the jet aircraft. Thank you for the press. Hallelujah. Thank you for the Holy Ghost. Thank you for the kingdom of God that's in me. Father, bless them. Bless them. Bless them. Bless them. Thank you. You are blessing us. Right now, your blessing is flowing. They sang, let the river flow. Yes, it's flowing. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. In the name of Jesus, these are special people, and we thank you for them. They're chosen, and you've chosen them, conforming them to the image of your son, Jesus. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.